This is a nice little uh, food forest bed here. So there's a, the apple trees and the rhubarb and the black currants. But then the function is really this back hedge here, this evergreen hedge that will be very easy to manage. And then there's just a, a random elderberry there in the middle as well, just to add something more native. But the, this, this is doing the job of blocking the wind. And then the shape is doing the job of catching as much water coming off here as possible. And then the, the edible things in here are the bonus. My name is Oren Crow, and just this time last year I moved home from France onto a small piece of land here that my parents have and I'd been living and working in France with my wife and two kids for the past 10 years. So I had a small market garden, a no-dig market garden, where I supplied CSA boxes to 15 or 20 members and I had a small microgreens business for restaurants and people that would be interested in microgreens. So since moving back here, we've only been here for 12 months now and we, this piece of land has always been in my mind to develop so I've thought about it quite a lot but never fully realised that I'd be back here doing it. Um, so it's a small little field, it's about 3,000 square metres and we'd like to develop it as a small homestead, not necessarily a business, just a homestead. And we're going to use as much uh, principles of permaculture as we can to, to work with the land the way it is and to utilise as many of the natural features as we can and to try and develop a system that will be very low maintenance so we can have the maximum yield from the small space and try and be a, for the system to be as self-sufficient as possible. So I'll show you around. So right now we're at the highest elevation of the property and the exposure, this is south and our prevailing wind is from the south and the slope is gradually heading all the way down to the back corner, um, kind of heading uh, northeast. So I'm really concentrating on the water flow across the property. So I'm trying to use that to my advantage as best I can. So up here, we've just removed some big trees from where you're standing and that's for the, to let the light in and with a small start of a hugel culture bed here and then just behind me this is a deep mulch area um, most of this stuff is experimental um, i i research as best as I, I can and then i like to try things and monitor it and see how it goes so because there's no light here this will probably be a small um, like uh, ferns, different types of ferns based on maybe like something you'd see in New Zealand or something like that. And these are some of the compost bays, which is, uh, I, try to, I try to do uh, hot composting always. Um, so it's not always possible, but as much as I can, I try to get the temperature of all the compost I use up to at least 50 or 60 degrees for a small period of time. Are you turning these like every three days or? In the summertime I would when, sure. I, have, uh, when I have the materials. Uh, so this one would have been turned every, uh, every three days last year. And I'd be pretty confident that there's very little weed seeds in here and it's, you know, crumbly and lovely compost, ready to go. Hmm. And then as soon as uh, we have more of an abundance of uh, green grass, I'll be able to get the temperatures up again. So it kind of, the, the composting process stops a bit throughout the winter. But that's, yeah, that's still like full of, full of worms. 
So I'll get some uh, green on this and keep it all going again. Are you using manure and wood chips? Uh, in this, no, there, mm. there is wood chips, but no manure. Right. This is just uh, green grass, hay, wood chips, and whatever materials I can get my hands on. Cool. Um, yeah, to, I do have, uh, I've just got a source of uh, pigeon, pigeon compost all right. and <laughs> horse manure. So I'm, I've, I'm using that directly in another area just to get the area going. But it would be ideal to compost it, hot compost first. Yeah, yeah. You know, but for now it's just, uh, it, it, it needs to be used. You'll see, you'll see where I have it because I've, uh, I've run out of um, space to plant potatoes. And, you know, doing no dig potatoes is really, you need a lot of material. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've really had to uh, bring that in and start using it straight away, the compost. Um, but this will all get up to temperature as soon as we add some green grass and in May, June, July and August, yeah, I'll be turning something every, every second day. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the energy to do every few uh, that, that frequently. I know like, you, can make, you can make compost so fast uh, if you do turn it that frequently. But Especially at yeah. that time of year. It's a hell of a job to be doing <laughs> every few days. So. Yeah, it's, it's really not bad once you kind of get into it. Like, mm. I just started moving a little bit of this, but there's a lot of straw and hay in there. And that is a, that's kind of hard. But as it breaks down, it becomes quite easy. It, it definitely becomes easier as we get on. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, this compost bay was here. My father used this for his tunnels. And oh. he's always had those there and he's kind of like got a raised bed system. Certainly not no dig, but raised beds. Cool. Yeah, so maybe we can have a look over there. This here is, uh, this was a big mound last year of, uh, of soil. It's like where my parents have spent 20 years of putting their weeding. You know, every time they weed something, it ended up here. Oh, right. So this is like a mound of topsoil, <laughs> basically, that's attached to all the weeds. So we've, uh, I'm not sure if I'd call it a food forest, because there's not really so many food crops there, but there's uh, more ornamental trees like um, eucalyptus and, eucalyptus and, oh, the names escape me. <laughs> for the moment. Sure. So that's just a little feature that we've been working on. So it'll be, it won't be very wet. So we have to be kind of careful what trees we put there, but once they establish, it should be okay. Be comfrey there as well. Yeah, Rubar I'm trying to, and... I'm trying to get comfrey into the middle of all the beds, borage and comfrey, yeah. Mm. Just kind of chop and drop. Um, mm. I'm not, I'm not sure. Even just, I think just, uh, yeah, probably, chop and drop or else make tea as I need it <laughs> and yeah but I think just as a part of the design so like there's you know these things are just naturally occurring and then there's uh, raspberries rhubarb some shrubs and the comfrey in the middle the comfrey is there and then willow and eucalyptus um, this lavender and we just uh, we did weed it originally and just covered it in wood chips and I'm sure the weeds are going to bounce back this summer but eventually we'll we'll get on top of it <laughs> hmm. so this is the first watershed so all the water that comes from this area here this is where it seems to pool so I'm probably not going to build a, a pond here because it's, uh, it, it's maybe too close to the tunnels. So I'm going to do uh, bamboos and plants that can soak up a lot of the water <laughs> here. And this will be the first uh, ca water catchment for what's coming off this little slope here. Cool. And then the rest, this tunnel is going to be moved as soon as the temperature comes up. We're going to move this tunnel just a little bit over there. So this will kind of be a patio area for the house. Nice. So if you want to have a look at this now. So at the, 
it will eventually be like uh, medicinal herbs and culinary herbs. Sure. Um, so at the moment, it's just for, uh, for my aubergines and peppers are here to get off to a good start. Your peppers are a lot bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I bring them in every night. They're in the house every night. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, these are out here during the day, and then uh, because and it's really practical. That's dedication. <laughs> well, it, it, I, but I'm only I'm only looking to to feed six or eight people. Sure. Yeah. You yeah. know, like when I when I done the CSAs in France, yeah, that wasn't possible. You know, yeah. it logistically wasn't possible, or my tunnel was two hundred meters away from the house. Sure. So if you had a big strong wind when you're trying to, it, it would all just be dead and blown over when you're carrying it back in in the crate. <laughs> So, but it, it's working really good um, when it's on such a small scale, I'm really able to keep on top of hmm. things like that. And then I have some um, Espelier pears here, which will kind of, we sure. can see outside after, but they'll form a, a walkway. So it'll be pears on this side, raspberries on the other side, and a little arch at the end. So for now, I'm just using this area to kind of have extra space for extra garlic, extra potatoes, and there is onions planted already underneath those peppers. <laughs> but this tunnel will, uh, will move in, in a few months. So there's a start, there's my uh, comfrey again and borage here around the base of the pears. And I'll uh, slowly work those into, into, that, into that shape. You know, there's lovely, there's lovely flowers on the pears already, but obviously that's because we're under plastic. So yeah. I'm not sure their first year will be. And, uh, and then just a, a little worm farm here for catching the worm juice and a small little crop of uh, fev, broad beans. <laughs> I find uh, broad beans do great under plastic. Yeah, you say, yeah. Yeah, like it, it's, if, if space is an issue, it's too much, to, it's a waste of space. But if it's not, you don't have to pinch them out or anything. So they just grow an abundance of, of uh, broad beans because the, the black fly doesn't get them. Hmm. So it's, if you have a little bit of space for broad beans, it's great. Hmm. So that's, that's all really that's going on in here. Cool. So I suppose here the, the reed bed could be good. And there's just some nice bamboos here. And these, uh, these are ash, but as you can see, they really have the ash dieback mm -hmm. disease, as does the whole line of ash down at the bottom. So, you know, I'm not counting on those being there for long, unfortunately. Mm. I think this is basically what's just going to become of all of them, which is terrible, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so it's everywhere where we are as well. Yeah. yeah, and when you're driving around in the summer, you can just see it up at the tops of big trees. You can see that there's no leaves on it. Yeah, yeah. and Kilkenny is full of ash trees. Yeah. It's like every roadside is just covered in ash, ash and sycamore, and it just yeah. they're so all going to start the coming landscape yeah. When they're gone, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a, it's going to be a big difference. Um, so here we have a, a little reed bed. So this is for the for grey water treatment. This is only the grey water from the washing machine, the kitchen sink, and the shower. So there is plants in there now, but they're uh, they were planted last May, which probably isn't a good time to get something established. But most of them have survived the winter, and I really expect to see some growth in there. So this is uh, grey water comes through a grease trap and goes in here on this uh, inch and a half white pipe at the top and soaks through uh, three different gradients of pebble. And obviously the root systems of the reeds and the iris will also filter that water. And then at the bottom, it connects into the four inch pipe uh, the four inch pipe is in the same shape as the white, but inverted. So it's draining out one meter underneath, underneath the stone at this end. And it goes down to where the, all this willow is. So it, uh, it should be clean water by the time it comes out of here. Amazing. 
Um, so the willow is just, it's those two lines of willow. The willow structure is a separate. Yeah. Uh, that's just something that looks nice. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and like, you definitely need to run it through something like that, like the grey water. You couldn't just water plants with it directly, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I think you could water plants yeah. directly, um, but uh, it's the volume of it and, w you know, like you need to use your shower all through December. Sure. So what would you do with that volume of water? Um, and like, you would be surprised, like from draining rice down the sink and hair and skin from the bathroom, yeah. it, there is a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, the grease traps, handy for that. How, how do you clean out the grease trap then? How does that work? I, uh, every, every month, I, do you want me to open it or? Uh, if you want to, if you can. Um, um. You know, I don't uh, clean as such, but I empty it every, uh, every month. So just from like olive oil, the starch from rice, potatoes and pasta, so there, there's re for a family of four, there really is a surprising amount of material going in. So like the idea of just collecting the water directly and storing it, I, I don't know, like it certainly could be a little, if you were having a heat wave, to be able to divert a pipe into a tunnel would be very useful, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but once it's left here, so then every, every few, uh, every once a month, I just take this out and eventually it will slowly drain away to a few, uh, to a small little bucket full of bits of rice and pasta. And then I'm not, uh, I can put that through a hot compost when the hot compost is up and running or I can uh, give it to the chickens. Sweet. You know, so it's, it'll probably take a while for that to drain away and I don't have gloves or anything on, but... I've, I've only just emptied it, so there's very little in there. Yeah. I emptied it a few weeks ago. But still, like, that's just, uh, that's soap and grease and starch. Hmm. So there is quite a lot in there. Nice one. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, our one gets clogged up very easily and there's no, like, you have to get down with your hands like to, pull, to unclog it, so. Yeah, um, like, I, I was probably going to design something like that, but then I was just in the DIY store and it was 150 euro and it was yeah. called a grease oh, trap. That's, that's and I way just better. Thought, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should definitely, you know, it would have been in my design, it was a blue barrel that you'd be scooping out. Yeah. No, ours is just a drain that goes into a soak hole, so like... Into a soak hole, yeah. Uh, it's going into the... No, it's going into the septic tank, actually. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it goes into the septic yeah. tank, yeah. So my father did divert the grey water from the septic tank into a soak hole. Yeah, yeah. So like he has a... He has like... It's, it's basically that, but without a PVC liner and without the roots of the reeds to filter the water. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, I haven't, uh, I've no way of testing it, of course, but it, it's much cleaner than that at the other end. <laughs> yeah. You know, definitely much cleaner than that. And then, you know, hopefully we'll have, uh, climbers and stuff will grow down here <laughs> and reeds and irises will grow up and it'll hide all the PVC in the blocks. <laughs> Very cool. And then the, and that's the willow then at the end. So the four, four inch pipe comes under the ground and then forks out here. And there it's a uh, perforated holes. So there's a row of willow here and a row of willow here. So that uses up all of the access uh, nitrogen and phosphorus that's in the grey water and then by the time potentially any water that's leaving that leaves my property is very very clean 
if it hasn't been used up, whatever soaks back into the local drains or rivers is clean. <laughs> Although it's a very long way from, it's probably going to be clean anyway, but it certainly is clean uh, and the willow will grow here. And again, this is south, so my prevailing wind is coming this way. So I'm doing everything to create shelter belts and wind protection for the tunnel, for the big tunnel. Hmm. So that, that's here, these willows. And then as we go down, there's, uh, there's more willows. So the wood chips here, will, it has willows on both sides and that will eventually be an arch, a tunnel. Uh, we'll weave the willows together as, as they, you know, I guess in five years time, it'll look more like this. You know, this one, this one, and we'll be able to weave those across and the other one across, and it'll be a lovely feature, but it will also be a living windbreak as well as a nice feature. And then inside that again, I have uh, hawthorn and alder, which I'll coppice the alder, and that will add an extra, so it'll be really like, <laughs> it'll be four ditches stopping the prevailing south wind, and it will be coppiced, and the willow can be cut, so it won't, it won't block my light. It'll, it'll offer a lot of windbreak eventually. Um, and then, yeah. We can see that. And you wouldn't use more evergreen for shelter? Or um, well, like, yeah, there is some there, but that's more to hide the yeah. next door. Um, I don't know. I, I like to be able to have, like, to have the several uses because we'll be able to use the willow sure. itself. Yeah. So it, it's like every every system will have uh, will provide two or three different yeah, yeah. services. But does it provide enough shelter in the winter when it's like dormant? Um, hmm. Well, if you if you that's why I have four. So sure. when this is coppiced, I think uh, it's not going to be like a wall, but it's going to diffuse and deflect. Sure. And. From what I understand, it will do that for 15 or 20 meters, but it won't, uh, it won't stop the wind like a, a wall would. It'll just diffuse it and deflect it, and on the other side of it, it should be much calmer. Cool, yeah. yeah. So once things are coppiced and managed, uh, I think it will offer a, quite a degree, because I still have these alder as well, which will all be eventually coppiced. So, it will be five, but nothing will be evergreen. Yeah, that's right. But then over here, we can come back around to there or we can go over if you want. This is evergreen, this little triangle here. Do you want to have a look at that? Yeah. So like this is where I come out when it's really windy. And I look at the side of my tunnel and I think, oh no, I don't want that wind hitting the tunnel. So this little V shape here is, uh, so there's holly and, uh, you know, the, all the standard laurel and things that grow really fast. So this will be an evergreen um, triangular shape taking the, the pressure point is this corner on the tunnel. So this will take any wind coming directly from the south. This will diffuse that. So the, like the willow arch is more just to slow it down. And then this will really deflect it. And here there's some uh, black currants. This will be a little black currant hedge. And then often the wind changes from due south to a little like this. So this is going to be another at the back here these are all evergreen hedges so this is the point i'm trying to protect so this evergreen hedge will be offering protection for that and then to get another use out of this area inside i have my rhubarb patches with my borage and my comfrey 
and inside that uh, red currents. So the, and also if you see the lie of the land here, you can see the, this is the, what we call the football pitch. <laughs> so there's a huge amount of water coming down here and most of it does go through just where you're standing and it settles here in the middle of the apple orchard. Uh, so I might need to build some uh, swales along here. I'll probably put a comfrey bed uh, all the way along here, which will take the access water. But this little area here will take all uh, will take the water that comes off this. Um, so then you have red currents here and black currents here, and this will be holly and laurel and the more standard evergreen trees to, uh, to, to get this prevailing wind that yeah, I have yeah. to deal with off the tunnel here. Nice. <laughs> it's nice you saw that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think, and then, so after the, so you can see the land, you know, you can see there's a hollow here. Mm. So all of this water, when we have a big rain event, it will all come down off this footpath, going up to the back door, and it will all come down off here, and that all drains and settles into the middle of the orchard, which is, it's not really on contour, it's much more in a grid design, mm. but it, it kind of is on contour, like, you know, those two, and these three, and then these three here, as the water is stepping back like this, and then I can just build a swale here, to hold up the water and to help it settle in more. Brilliant. So again, the, all of these apple trees and then there's uh, uh, different types of hazelnuts at the back. Um, so they're all just one year old so far. So, um, but they done well in the heat wave last year, hmm. you know? Uh, did you plant them in for the winter or before the summer? Uh, um, Did, were they in the ground in the winter? Like? They were in the ground <laughs> in the winter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I planted uh, these, the bigger ones were planted as we were moving in. I was planting apple trees and then the smaller ones at the edge were planted this winter. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, this is a nice little uh, food forest bed <laughs> here. So there's uh, the apple trees and the rhubarb and the black currants. But then the function is really this back hedge here, this <laughs> evergreen hedge that will be very easy to manage. And then there's just a, a random elderberry there in the middle as well, just to add something more native. <laughs> but the, this, this is doing the job of blocking the wind. And then the shape is doing the job of catching as much water coming off here as possible. And then the, the edible things in here are the bonus, <laughs> you know, to have this stuff. So like not, nothing here is more than 12 months old. So I'm really, I know it just looks like sticks in the <laughs> ground, <laughs> but I'm really hoping that uh, in two or three years, what I'm saying will be more self-evident. Yeah, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be good. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, does this, uh, does this one come across here? So there's a, there is willow and dogwood and then there's some uh, mallow I found is really good because it, for some reason, maybe it's just a mild winter, but it keeps its leaves. So this is kind of shrubs at this side and then it's thick double planted evergreen on this side and this uh, structure here is temporary. <laughs> you know. So this is our little chicken tractor, I suppose, which uh, theoretically we move a little bit every day, but it's going to need wheels on it because uh, it's quite heavy, yeah. but I can do it by myself but I'm starting to pull the structure apart because mm -hmm. it gets caught in clumps of grass. So I will need to run some three by two around the bottom and attach uh, wheels. And then there are the eggmobiles inside. Hmm. 
and we can uh, run a little in the summertime when things are growing quicker and there's a uh, Oh, yeah. And there's more stuff I can do an electric fence and extend it maybe around the trees in the forest area or <laughs> or wherever they need to be. What breeds are they? I don't it's really know. Yeah. My my wife uh, kind of does that. I'm not really sure. I'm not really into chickens. <laughs> I love having eggs. I love having the compost, but uh, yeah, I don't really uh, handle them or... <laughs> <laughs> the boys are great with dealing with the chickens. <laughs> if one of them escapes, I just uh, I have to call the kids out and the kids catch them. Nice. Handy. Yeah. <laughs> and what's this? Is this a tree house over here? Yeah, this is a tree house structure. <laughs> cool. And I did, this is another area again that my parents have been putting wood on for years and years mm. so it was like well what will we do with that like will we uh, will we just burn it or will we hire a chipping machine and pull it all out and chip it but I kind of thought that it looks like really great habitat yeah. for hedgehogs amongst other things I'm sure so I'm actually going to leave it and around the perimeter I've uh, planted uh, dog rose and hawthorn and I hope to add a uh, gorse and broom. So it will just become a big, uh, dense habitat for whatever might be living, hopefully not foxes living this close to the chickens, <laughs> but hedgehogs or whatever. It's just another area then that will be wild and we won't touch because we won't really be able to access it. Okay. So again, just instead of, uh, instead of finding a solution that has a wood chipper that uses diesel and you have to go off site and get it and bring it here even though it would be okay because you'd have the wood chips to use but it's more just uh, work with it <laughs> so have it as a feature instead of a, instead of a problem turn it into something useful um, yeah, we we had a similar pile, uh, and I, I wood chipped it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Come yeah, on. yeah. No, I, yeah. I, it's uh, it's definitely worth doing. But I did mm. want to. I did it during the winter, though, when kind of you know when there, there wouldn't be things there. Uh, yeah. Not as much things there anyway. Uh, yeah. And just, you couldn't because uh, there was nettles growing up. Like it's a great nettle patch. Yeah. Uh, and I'll sure. probably I'll leave, let let the nettles go in this year because uh, yeah. like I, we eat them and. Oh, you eat the nettles? Yeah. Have you? Uh, yeah, I've had nettle yeah, yeah. soup. It is nice. Um, nettle pesto is so good. Really? Yeah. Just like, follow a normal pesto recipe? Yeah, yeah. Just put yeah, nettles. Yeah. Great. Um, like, it's it's actually, like, well worth it. Yeah. Um, you know, I know they'll say, like, a lot of things are edible, like, all those sorts of things around, yeah. but, like, it's whether you want to. Maybe whether you, whether you it's edible, but do you want to yeah. eat it? Like, for nettles, yeah. Yeah, really good. And, and then you have a uh, habitat so for ladybirds with the nettles. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. that's, yeah. And uh, do you make a tea? tea? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, with the comfrey and borage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and nettles, yeah. Mostly nettles, uh, I'm still, the comfrey is still kind of establishing and stuff, so. Yeah, yeah I, I'm the same. Like, uh, I, I grow a lot of borage and it does work, but to get a, to get a huge comfrey patch seems to take a few years. Yeah. yeah, so I really don't have much of that at all. But, uh, but I just, uh, I'm just really aware of like, it's a really small area. It's like 3000 square meters, give or take. So it would be very easy just to impose our own ideas onto the land and use every bit of it. And then you could find yourself in a situation where there isn't anything wild and natural because even where we're standing now is uh, is meadow so this hasn't been cut in at least 15 years there hasn't been animals on it or there hasn't been hay taken off it hmm. like where the kids play football we we use the lawnmower but i really want to have this patch here and that one patch over there and never do anything with it because the the species in the summertime that's just not you know instead of going around with wild flower mixes there's a lot of stuff here already mm. 
for sure. Yeah. And we find frogs and newts and loads of mushrooms grow as well. Mushrooms that are that need this kind of uh, spongy. It's, mm. You can see it's just like layer and layer and layer and layer <laughs> of never being cut. So it's just the frost killing the grass, providing nutrients for the next year's grass to grow. <laughs> so I, I really hope we won't keep encroaching onto this little area and sure. that little area over there. Yeah, I'd say it's lovely during the summer. When yeah, it really is. Flowering and the grass. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Because like I think it would be really easy just to put more garden beds in here or get another 20 chickens. But then, you know, the chickens would just have the whole field scratched to pieces and you'd kind of, you know, <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be trying to repair the damage that the chickens are doing. <laughs> so I, I really want to leave the, because again, these are, this is naturally what's here. So I kind of like to leave it do its own thing. And uh, even between all the alder we've planted, uh, all of the white thorn has all come back naturally itself. None of the white thorn is planted. I've, I've planted uh, hedgerows of apples and roses and hazel and holly and elderberries, but all of the white thorn is naturally establishing. I guess it's from birds. Mm, yeah, if, uh, f yeah, field that we have, it just seems to come up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I, sub I sub like when you look at all the hedgerows in the area, like it's all just hawthorn. Mm. So, was this whole green area was all of these hills hawthorn? I think like they used thousands to of years ago. Like they were planted by the farmers hundreds of years ago. Like. Uh, Really? There's actually some way, I can't remember, there's some way of telling whether it's actually planted or old growth. Really? I can't remember what it is, so. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they used to plant, like, it's the best thing to plant for, even, uh, like, recently, like, people, farmers would still plant hawthorn. It's just great for keeping in sheep and stuff as yeah. well, because it, it's spiky and acts, yeah. as a, acts as a fence. And it acts as more of a natural fence. Yeah or stops them from breaking down a fence that you put in, like it kind of keeps them away from it. Yeah. Uh, they don't be scratching themselves on it. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting to know, like was it hawthorn everywhere and mm. we carved the fields out or did we mm. cut down the trees I'd and plant hawthorn in yeah. grid sections? I'd say they were propagated mostly. Really? Yeah. 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 When you think of how much there is. Hawthorn slow. Uh, yeah. Blackberry, because yeah. they're just all like sheltering and uh, spiky, kind of good, good yeah. for keeping in animals. Yeah, that's right. They all have the spikes. And then ash and mill. Like I, I think like they knew a lot more than we give them credit for a few hundred years ago. Like they yeah, knew what they were doing. So. They had a lot. Like they put put in a, a good, diverse kind of hedgerow. Yeah. Back then. Because like you say, it is, it's blackberries, sloes, hawthorn, some elder, and ash, hmm. and beech. And sycamore. Here, here we have beech, yeah. more than sycamore, we, right. we have beech here. Yeah, yeah, not much beech in the hedgerows. Where we yeah, are. no, we like, uh, like see those big trees up the top of the hill? Hmm. They'd, that's all beech and ash. Hmm. I know it's a lot of birch on the way down as well. Uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of birch in the hedgerows, you wouldn't see much birch in the hedgerows. Uncle Kenny. Yeah, there's yeah a lot of birch as well. Um, and then would you have a chestnut? Oh, like, like yeah, a good bit of horse, sycamore, ch horse yeah, chestnut. Yeah, sycamore. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Have you tried to grow any? Like uh, a sweet ones. We've or? we've horse chestnut in the garden. I have. I'd love to get my hands on a sweet chestnut. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I can't yeah. get one at the. There is a there is a website. Um, I'll have to give it to you later. Cool. But I think you need to order in bulk. But if you had a few people, like I brought three from France, because hmm. uh, it's easier to buy them there. So and uh, walnuts as well. So there, you know, I hope to get a lot of nuts. Yeah, uh, uh, someone gave me a walnut tree recently. So yeah. I was looking for a walnut and a sweet chestnut, and she said that someone gave her a walnut, so she gave me the walnut. Great. Yeah. So yeah. But like, that's going to be huge. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not really good at that. Like I just plant <laughs> trees, but yeah. to, to kind of picture them as being as big as I know they yeah. will be. Uh, it's, it's a future generations problem, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once they get established, you can, uh, you can deal with that. So this is another uh, little island with uh, native shrubs and trees. There's some uh, rowanberry, elder, um, uh, larch, <laughs> larch and fuchsia and things like that to have some flowers and it's a, a, li a little for the eye as well <laughs> in, the, in the middle of everything else. And we, uh, we have some, a little corpse of, uh, of walnut here. So uh, this one I just bought this year, which is great to have a tree this size. Yeah, just this room. <laughs> it feels like you're hitting the ground running. And then I have another one here that we brought over from France. So this one, is, we've had this for about 10 years and we we dropped a tree on it while cutting trees uh so it, you know it would be about this high so it's back here but it's i'm happy that it's uh, sprouting away nicely so i think it will be quite happy there <laughs> and a few more here and then th this area here where uh because i was just kind of observing the whole area and it has this growing here so I, I i didn't cut this back when i was strimming down here and then yeah when we had huge rain events throughout this winter all of this area was wet and marshy where i'm standing right now so this is where eventually the bigger pond the main pond that will be the last area to catch the water will end up here because this is where it wanted to go. So I thought that would be the best place to put it. So I had to, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do it because I won't get a machine in here now because of all the trees. So it's probably going to be by hand, which you guys have done. Yeah, small, small enough, the, the big one I did with a machine, small yeah. machine. It, it, it's probably not so much the size as the depth, is it, for digging by hand? Uh, yeah, well, pickaxe, like pickaxe, get, you get nice and deep with the pickaxe. Yeah. Like, and I could have done, I could have went further with, with, with that, it's just, that's the, the space that I had. Yeah. Um, it's not too bad, it's just a few days of, of a few, few nice sunny days, <laughs> yeah. away with a pickaxe, you get down and just... Uh, because I found, a, I did find a guy on YouTube um, and I really, I liked his style. He was kind of just, just dig a little bit, see what happens. <laughs> and then when it dries out next summer, then dig it bigger. Hmm. And then the following year, dig a bit more. So I'll probably do that. And then here down at the real end, we're going to have a little uh, apiary. So we only have one hive for the moment. And this is a lovely area where like all, this is all Rose Bay Willow Herb. So this is all naturally growing here and loads of flowers and the hawthorn here will be full of flowers. So the, the bees can be here. Which, uh, there's not much action today, but they, they have been out and about when we've had nice weather. And uh, these are all grown from cuttings, all this mallow and these are again just windbreaks for <laughs> the for the bees but I, a lot of uh, sea buckthorn here in this area uh, sea buckthorn mallow and hazel wild hazel along the hedgerow at the back in between the the alders um, is this your first time doing bees or do you have a lot of experience with no them? not at all no how's, no no how's it going? Like is it I, hard is it <laughs> i have no idea like yeah. uh that was just put there this winter and i'm comfortable enough to kind of look there at the front and i have a brand new bee suit only worn twice <laughs> so what to do next i have no idea <laughs> i need i need some help and did you join a bee club or anything like that no uh, a friend was moving house and his new house wasn't suitable for the hive. 
Right. So we, we just put it here. Cool. Um, and I I will get my own oh, hive. So going in there now. One. Huh? Saw one going in there now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you can probably see. I, I think we're okay here. Like, we'll, we'll move quickly if anything happens. But I guess you'll, you'll get some. Oh, yeah, there's another one. Look. There's another one. Yeah, I'd love love to get bees. I don't like being stung though. I'm not really, no, not neither. really a fan. <laughs> but I, I've been coming down here, and definitely when they came here, they would kind of uh, yeah. bounce on you, which they don't do now. Hmm. So you know, that's all I've been doing is coming down here once every second day and standing here for two minutes, whether it's my saint or whatever. So uh, I've no idea what's going to happen when we lift this off and look inside. <laughs> But yeah, there are clubs to join and, you know, I will have to get help yeah. with the next stage. It's just getting the hive, I think, is, is really the... Yeah. To, you have to kind of wait for someone to say that they need a hive moved or something like that. Yeah. Just be, have to be on a waiting list. So I, I'm going to get another box and put myself on a waiting list mm. and kind of... There's a thing called splitting a hive as well. Yeah, sometimes they can have like two be two queens or something, can't they? Yeah. So it, it, if that could work out, I have no idea if it could, but <laughs> if that would be really handy to uh, to be able to split this hive between another box just here. And do you have any idea how much honey you'll get off the one hive? Or? I think yeah. uh, people talk about like uh, in a good year, like uh, 12 jars, 12 <laughs> small jars. <laughs> Because you, you have to leave, uh, you have, they're like, there's two, I think they're called supers, but I'm, I, I really don't know. <laughs> so you have to leave one for the, the bees reserves, to, yeah. yeah, for them to eat the following winter. So yeah, that's really, uh, I don't know anything about keeping bees, <laughs> you know, really like. Cool. So that's just, we'll play it by ear and see how it goes. Nice. But you know, that's cool, like we're standing here. <laughs> a bit nervous. Um, so all you know, all of these are just planted this year. All of these trees. So I've, I've. Uh, there's a mix of everything. You know, I, I don't know what's what anymore because I, you know, I was just planting them. So anything without a label or that isn't obviously a sea buckthorn, I don't really know what it is. But uh. That would be fun to, to learn those. And do you do much of your designing on paper? Is it all kind of just on the ground? Or the do you have any map? Do you do any maps or anything like that? Or? Not on nothing compared to the level that you do. Yeah. Like not, not like that at all. It's very much just like a four different color pens, a quick sketch. Yeah, like yeah. so it's like I knew that a pond would go somewhere down here at the end. I knew the bees would go somewhere down here as far away from the house as possible. Uh, but I, I really just put that tunnel there because it's the most level piece of land. And then all of the windbreaks and the watershed came after as I observed it. Hmm. I, 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 don't have the, I don't have the skills to be able to put that on paper first. So I'm just kind of learning as I go for everything, really. Yeah. No, it's just probably best to see it more than like it it's always different on paper than it is in reality. So yeah, but yeah. it would I would really like yeah. to have that uh, that uh, Jeff Lawton too, style. <laughs> you know, I'd really like to have a plan like that to mm -hmm. work from, which of course would change as you go along. Yeah, but I, sure. I would really like that. But I I don't know. So it's just. Like after you can kind of see how, you can really see how the water moves, I think. Mm. And especially when the grass is short, mm. you can really see it. Like I would have guessed that the pond would go there, but in the middle of winter, that's dry and that's wet. Mm. So the pond goes there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so he, like, and see here the way the, the, Apple Orchard is just on the other side of the tunnel. So I'm going to dig a, would you call it a trench or a dike? 
here at the back of the tunnel to keep all the water from this side of the tunnel and that will all make its way into this pond. Nice. Anything that I'll have like a, a swale at the other side and a sill and when it breaches the sill it'll go into a trench here and make its way down into the pond and that will catch all the water off this side which is north. <laughs> And then here there's a little like a gooseberry hedge. And then this is another little uh, shrub island on this side. And a quince tree nice. and a mallow. So like this, this bed here was something that uh, it, it, it started really with, uh, with me not being happy with how tight the plastic was on the tunnel. Hmm. So then I put sandbags there. <laughs> and then I realized that I hated the sandbags because <laughs> they looked terrible. And then there was puddles starting to form from the water that the orchard fails to catch. So then I, it, it slowly developed organically having this idea and the shape is really, you can see it here, but you can see it better from the other side. You know, it, it it's uh, maybe it's called a keyhole design. Yeah, I it's think. a keyhole. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and just yeah, a long edge having a, a yeah. large edge, and, yeah. and having the edge, and then little uh, in place uh, worm worm towers. So they'll uh, they'll feed the little area around them, and the worms are already in there. So I can just add my compost bin on top of this pipe, and water it. Cool and it'll, it'll all come out here like this. <laughs> and I ran, so th this is the compost uh, that I was talking about, the pigeon and horse. Right. So the first bit up at the top has been there for a few weeks and there's very little weeds growing so far, but I, I think really like, you know, horse manure is gonna have loads of weeds, but I wanted to have a place to grow a lot of potatoes this year and the function that it's performing from hiding the sandbags. So I might end up putting more cardboard on top of this manure and putting a small layer of uh, hot compost on top of that going into next winter. And then this time next year, I won't have weeds. <laughs> but it's the real standard uh, Charles Dowding, no dig cardboard compost <laughs> and ready to go. And then this, uh, this tunnel is the main growing tunnel. So I, uh, I have uh, quite a few trees in here and a heat table. So this is like the, this side is the standard one with the sand and the cable. <laughs> and then over this side for the tomatoes is a, a heat mat. And I just cover it every night and a little uh this banana tree came over from france as well and it was going really good there until that hard frost last yeah. year or last week so in here we have uh i did broad fork this area first and i regret that first yeah it uh it done something to the cooch grass it's like it it somehow kind of motivated it to uh to grow hmm. you know because i disturbed the roots so much so uh like out here was just cardboard compost on the grass and if i was doing this again i would have i would do that hmm. you know and that is what charles dowding says as well just to go compost and yeah. again it's just another case of uh trial and error and i see that now so, nice uh, early spots yeah Again, I'm covering, covering that every night so that they will work. And here's my borage. I don't know like how much uh, frost it can take. I think it, it probably is OK to go out now. <laughs> so I might put it out. And once it gets established, it, it grows back really good. Um, like all of these are seeded from one borage plant that was growing in this uh, fig tree pot and for about 
three years now, three or four years, I, I've just, this for some reason is just full of seeds, of endless <laughs> forage seeds. So I just pot them up every year and I let one grow in the pot with the fig and every spring there's loads of little cuttings ready to pot up. Nice. And then here I have a kiwi, which uh, just got hit by the frost. Look, it was doing really mm. good. So I plan to, oh yeah, no, I don't know what I plan to do with that kiwi. Those three grapes, I'm going to trellis across the supports. So there's uh, white grapes and... Does kiwi end up like a grape? Like it kind of vines like a grape, doesn't it? It, it does, but it's really uncontrollable. Like, yeah, I don't know how, what's going to happen. Really, like. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the same. Like I've, I've done one in France on a south facing wall. And like, you know, the guy told me that you have to be really prepared, you know. So I, I drilled holes in the stone wall and put in wall plugs and eye hooks and steel wire. And now here, I've just kind of put it there without any of that infrastructure <laughs> in, in place. So it, it really is hard to manage them. Yeah, uh, they do grow exactly like a grapevine, but they, it, it happens really quick and they're really powerful. <laughs> you know, like they can pull stones out of walls. And what? Yeah, like it, it, it's really heavy the, once it gets established. There's a huge amount of weight on it. So I, I don't know what I'm going to do there. Like, I guess I'll have to... I don't know. That's just a pea trellis. That has nothing to do with, <laughs> with the kiwi. <laughs> and it's a self-fertile <laughs> variety. I do have a male and female uh, Howard, I think, is the, the normal kiwi. So I'm going to uh, do that somewhere else. Maybe try it outside and just see what happens. <laughs> um, and then I just have my starts and a lot of... Uh, a lot of extra things just to see do you get earlier crops from being in the tunnel, I assume you do. So I have blueberries and black currants and figs. I think there is quite a few figs on the fig tree there. Whether they'll be able to develop, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then, so this is the main, the main growing area. Are you saving seed from? The scale? Or no, I uh, it, I kind of use them like purple sprout and broccoli. Really? Yeah, it's really great. It's red Russian, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. like it's sweet and juicy, like that already. You know, you can really see. Hmm. You know, so as a stir fry. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. always uh, do this with uh, white turnips as well. Like all all year round from like I put these in at the same time as my overwintered spinach so I guess they go in in October and I never harvest the the actual turnip there's one in there a giant one I never harvest that I just keep cutting it back and it doesn't matter what the weather is like you have a constant supply it, it grows much quicker than the red Russian kale and spinach and you can just use all the turnip greens in stir fries and it's just like an endless supply all all winter long it grows it grows quicker than mescaline and it's just always something that you can like that's going to seed now so that's not that's fine to use in the same way as that like a purple sprout and broccoli substitute but it's really these these leaves this kind of size that i'm uh, using in stir fries all all winter long. So good. Uh, and here's some elephant garlic and different types of garlic that I'm trialing to see which works best mm. in this climate. I just uh, what garlic do you find is good? Um, I think I've mesodrome in. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of it. Uh, okay, but I do yeah. have that. I haven't, I haven't trialed many different ones. Like that's just the one that I kind of decided to go on this year. <laughs> yeah. Do you use Fruit Hill Farm? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then some. Uh, these are uh, goji berries from cuttings. 
So there a be each of the little food forests or islands that we've looked at will will have uh, one of these. There's one of those for each of those, and the same with the borage. Hmm. And the the chamomile is ready to go out as well. Nice. It's really nice to have the chamomile flowers. Hmm. And you dried it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you, do you just string it up or? No, uh, cut the cut the flowers and just leave them on a baking tray in a hot window. Hmm. In, in the front, in the front of your car is great. Right. <laughs> you know, in the on the da a baking tray on the dash of your car facing south on a two or three days over a heat wave, hmm. everything will dry. Hmm. Even uh, even mushrooms will dry w in in that. It's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I will get a, a dehumidifier or what's it called. Uh, or yeah, dehydrator. A dehydrator, mm. yeah. But that that works in the car. Hmm. And then there's mm. some uh, corn here. We got a really great result with this small uh, purple corn last year for popcorn. Cool. So it uh, it grows and it's uh, you couldn't eat it as a corn on the cob. It's hard, but it's a uh, popcorn, and the kids can make their own. They can grow their own corn and make their own popcorn. Wow, that yeah. is so good. Cool. <laughs> it works really well, yeah. Um, it's this red one here, and then this other one is normal corn. And then this is amaranth, so it's cool. just part of uh, experimenting with growing a supplementary feed for chickens. Cool. Um, we were growing it for the, the greens. Like, uh, it's really big in Taiwan, uh, the amaranth greens in stir fry okay. so much yeah. just as as the stir fry the stem and all and, yeah. okay the stem is edible and you're getting it before it forms that uh, seed pod hmm. like there's yeah. kind of it, yeah, it looks yeah. like the boom on the mic almost when it goes to seed doesn't yeah, it? yeah yeah no uh, we harvest it before it because it gets good woody if you, okay. if you let go to seed Oh yeah, yeah, well I'll yeah I'll try some of that as well. Uh, it's the green one. I don't know, but I presume the purple one's just the same. This is purple. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I it's just because I used to do it as a microgreen, so I have so many seeds. <laughs> That's why I have the red one because hmm. it's more interesting for microgreens. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm aware of the green one as well. I should try that. The green beans are quite slow. It's really hard to get them to germinate, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah. find. Really Are you, they'll probably be going in here. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. yeah this early. Yeah, then. I have more germinating inside, but they can, they can go in uh, now, anytime. You know, maybe a fleece over them if uh, if we have really cold weather. <laughs> but yeah, they're ready to go in. And the the corn can stand in, in. I'll grow it in the tunnel. The corn, I'll interplant it with this uh, garlic here, and it'll be ready to go. <laughs> I. You're not doing like three sisters or anything like that with the, the corn, squash and I, I did in the old tunnel last year. Cool. Um, I've never tried that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it this year for the laugh. You, sh you should. It, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting. I, I found that uh, I think the problem was that I put too much stuff in that small tunnel. Hmm. So I, I think if you tried that here in this tunnel and had better spacings, I think you'd get a really good result. But I had one of the beds as the three sisters and then the other bed was tomatoes and I had, pun had more pumpkins growing. So it was just too much green yeah. inside that small tunnel. Mm -hmm. So things didn't develop really as good as they should. Yeah. Every time I plant squash, I, plant, I just, I forget that it turns into this massive thing. <laughs> I plant I them like, there's no way this little tiny thing is going to be that big. I, I always yeah. put them like a foot apart and it just always ends up in a mess. So this yeah. year I'm going to, I'm, I have to stick to planting them spaced out. Are you going to put them <laughs> in the tunnel? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll be doing an early squash in the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. what variety? Uh, I'll just uh, courgettes, like uh, mainly. Yeah. Uh, like little courgettes. Small courgettes. To sell uh, mostly. Oh, yeah. And then of I'll be course. doing win winter squash outside, yeah. uh, pumpkins and butternut, and then uh, what's the, like the honey, uh, what's it called? The one with the green stripes on it. I think I got some blue. Oh, is it called delicata? No. Um, uh, no, it's not. Uh, what shape is it? Roundy or? It's like uh, long with the the kind of green. It's yellowy with green stripes. It's kind of decorative squash. Oh yeah, okay. Funky, funky winter squash. <laughs> yeah. 
There's loads of them. I, there I is think loads. I have, a, I have a few blue ones as well, which is kind of cool. Queensland blue, is it? It's, I can't remember what variety they, they, That keeps really well. Hmm, right. Yeah. Yeah. It keeps yeah, they really all, well. Yeah. And the butternut squash in the tunnel does amazing. Hmm. It does really, yeah, really yeah, well. Yeah, I've done it. did it in the greenhouse in the tunnel last year. Yeah. Um, and a few outside. And so yeah, I think I will, I'm going to put eight plants in this row here, in this back row. So it'll grow out and I'll be able to walk along the path and cut it back and stop it from choking whatever is in this bed. Hmm. But I really will just put eight because I have the same problem. I put it too much. <laughs> and, yeah. But I, but it's really nice this year because I don't feel under any pressure because I'm not selling anything. Yeah. So yeah. it is fine to to have the squash take over the beans. <laughs> we we grow a lot of beans to uh, like uh, lima bean and borlotti bean cool. and yin yang beans uh, <laughs> to save for having beans in the in the winter. Cool. So we'll dry them. Um, How do you dry the beans? Uh, well, in France in the tunnel on the pod and the weather was good enough in September that they would be dry and you could just uh, put them in a crate and maybe leave them on a sunny windowsill for a few days hmm. but last year here in Ireland they started to rot hmm. before that happened so I don't know hmm. I'm gonna have to harvest them earlier and I'll probably carry crates around following the sun <laughs> propping them against this wall um, yeah cool but it's on such a small scale that I will be able to keep up with that. Yeah. You put down this tunnel by yourself? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's a yeah. nice one. It's yeah. serious, serious tunnel. Yeah, like I brought it over from France as well. Right. <laughs> so I, I rented a truck to bring this tunnel over. Because <laughs> nice. it's the tunnel. I had two of these in France. And we managed to uh, convince the people that were buying our house to take the two tunnels. Because I had planned on dismantling them. but. I was able to sell them with the house and then I could buy this one brand new because I'm sure I just didn't look hard enough, but I, I couldn't immediately find something as good in Ireland. Yeah, no, that like we got one that's pretty much that thickness. Like, yeah. You know, which is like, you know, we have one that's that thickness and it's 10 years old and there's never been a problem with it. But yeah, these ones, one of those is there for 15 years. Yeah. You know, like I'm talking about. And those are pretty thin, wind. like they're, those are thinner than, than yeah. us. Yeah. They're really thin so and like, there hasn't been yeah. a problem, but I just, yeah, I just, wa I just really like yeah. the design. Peace of mind. <laughs> you know, and the size of the bar mm. and there, there's a few little techniques like these don't go into the ground. It's really interesting. These are just, uh, uh, they're just there hmm. and there's this is the plastic going into the ground oh the plastic is yeah like you can get channel like trenched in like yeah this yeah. is just trenched in as normal yeah. but the whole structure is sitting on top of the ground and in between all of the uprights there's this little design i i think it's the company that makes it that has come up with it and it's a long bar and you hammer that and it's a you hammer that into the ground and then they have a little tool that you hammer inside a hole inside that, which pushes wire out of the end. So it's like a stake that's in the ground and there's a little mechanism that by tapping on the top with a hammer, you're pushing a wire which curves out like this and there's four of them in each of these. Nice. So it's anchoring into the ground like that. Cool. So, yeah. the, so, so I just, uh, that was crazy to have just come over in the middle of the pandemic last year with it on a ghost ship, <laughs> you know, with truckers and me with a tunnel and a rented van. Um, but yeah. So, and that's why I'm all about uh, windbreaks and stuff like that to, hmm. to extend the life of, of this tunnel. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we just put up our, our new one and the next day we had like that storm. No. <laughs> it's like, so kind of like in the middle of the night, it's like, it's down the field, I'm in bed, and it's kind of like, oh, is you, it up? Is it fucking up? halfway across the field? Did you get up in the middle of the night? No, I didn't get up. Oh, no, okay. I just kind of, like, <laughs> what could I do? <laughs> I couldn't I know, watch yeah. it. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, but yeah, it survived and it was fine. Uh, so, yeah, well, that, yeah. that's great. Yeah. It's, it's nice to have the kind of peace of mind that it survived that now, so I know that it will survive a, yeah. a storm. Yeah. Because it's in a fair, it's in a much windier spot than the one that we, their 10 year old one. Yeah. Um, 
that one is the one that's in your parents' garden. Like. Yeah, the, the yeah. one in front of the pond there. Yeah. That's the thing, like this is just slap bang in the middle of this field and there's no infrastructure around it to protect it. Because hmm. even my dad's one now, it's protected by our house. So that has more protection than it ever had. <laughs> and it's already lasted so long. But just, yeah, the, the coming out in the storms and checking it. That's from September, is it? Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's like seed started in the end of October, September. Hmm. And I find the best way to do that is to put it in the back corner of a dark shade, a cold stone shade, uh, because if you have it in here, like it won't germinate. Oh, the, yeah. the, you know, so to get it off to a good start and then it's planted in October hmm. and then it doesn't really do much until January. And then since the end of February, we're just eating this every day, nice. just a small little patch and watering it. And it, it does really good. <laughs> it's for what do we call that? Trish? The hungry gap. Is oh, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That time of year. <laughs> so it's like kale, purple sprout and broccoli, turnips and spinach. Hmm. And of course, squash. Yeah, from the last year. I'm blown away by the turnip idea. That's, that's awesome. It, it's, it's a cut and come again. <laughs> and you, ju <laughs> and you just, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah they're, they're Tokyo top turnips. Um, I don't harvest them. I do them at the same time as that. And like this has gone to seed now, but it's still really lovely to use like that. You can chop it up and it's all, it's a vegetable at this <laughs> stage. It's a, you know, it's, it has substance to it, <laughs> but all through winter when you couldn't harvest that spinach because it's just tiny leaves, <laughs> but these are leaves this size and you can just come in and cut like big bunches and then two weeks of gray, cold wind later, it's back again on top of the turnip, ready to be cut again. Awesome. And, uh, and then the carrot was a bit erratic, but I, you know, growing carrots in a no dig, first time no dig, I yeah. don't know what kind of result it, I was uh, did well, like I was yeah. surprised last year, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> they, they push into the clay. Uh, they were like, yeah, good, good, a lot of forking, but like, I don't mind yeah. that. Like, this yeah, tastes, yeah. tastes the same at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but like, a lot of good long ones, but like, and parsnips as well. I had parsnips, yeah. like, turnip size. Really? Like, and like, they went down like that far, like, really? they were crazy. Yeah. And that's just on four or five inches of compost. Uh, not even. Yeah, pr not even. Yeah. yeah. Kind of through cardboard and yeah. down through the compost and, yeah. How do you manage, like say when you were doing your tunnel, how do you get the cardboard? Like do you buy rolls or do you no, go I to the... No, uh, yeah, yeah. Like borrow and steal. Yeah. <laughs> and you just wait until you have enough. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I definitely didn't use enough in here. Yeah. Whereas I did here. Like, and I'm doing on that and trying to do kind of a small market garden, like so like on for small scale stuff, like, yeah. you know, a small, a small load would do you for the year, like nearly. Yeah. Um, I have a few, few different sources that uh, I, I get get the cardboard off of and just nice big sheets is the thing. It re and then yeah. overlap it. Yeah. yeah. Like what I done in here was I, it was like I felt I didn't have time or whatever to go to supermarkets. So I ordered it from a Donegal box company. Right. So it's rolls, yeah, uh, yeah. 80 meter rolls. And like you, you roll it out <laughs> and it's great. But it's just like yeah, that. really thin. Yeah, yeah. You want to be doubling that stuff up. I, I, I think even more weaving it hmm. that you'd want to double it and then you'd want to come across hmm. and maybe go over again yeah. because it 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 because that's how a box is. This is just one side of what a standard box is. So yeah, you really. But I didn't do enough in here, you know. I know it doesn't look it right now, but like you know, you can see. You know, like I, I'm weeding, I'm actively weeding this a lot. And like you can see the grass is just coming up. So I, you know, it will be another job to deal with in the future. I was probably in too much of a rush. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, you can never have too much cardboard and too much compost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Charles Dowding says put six inches of compost. <laughs> Don't bother trying to put two. Yeah, yeah, um, that's yeah, it really. So expensive it? though. I know, yeah. <laughs> Like this, uh, I got a, 
uh, a guy from Athlone was advertising mushroom compost, <laughs> a 20 ton trailer for, uh, I think it was 300. And I couldn't get a 20 ton trailer through my gate. So I said, like, can you bring 10 tons? You have a smaller trailer? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem, but it, it'll be the same price. I said, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I need it. Yeah. So that's what it is. So, mm. yeah. But it is amazing. Uh, like you said, you've, you've done all kinds of organic growing. And when you kind of see no dig working, because at the beginning, it's like, I don't want to be going around asking supermarkets for cardboard and getting trailer loads of compost. My time will be much better used doing something else. Yeah. But then once you have one season with no dig, you kind of realize, yeah. oh no, that's what you do at winter. You build up your cardboard, yeah, yeah. you build up yeah. your compost, <laughs> and then your summer is just easy, yeah, yeah. you know? I've, yeah, I've, I've just been blown away by the results of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> and the same thing, like I, 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 I kind of, I was in the, I used to have a little rotavator with my market garden. <laughs> and then I started to, you know, I was looking at like uh, Elliot Coleman and uh, Jean-Martin Fontier. Yeah. And then I kind of started to find Charles Dowding at the same time. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I'll put two inches of compost on a little piece and I could tell it was so much better, but I was trying to extend the compost I have until I eventually just on a small piece put loads, six inches of compost, and the results is it, just like, what was I doing up until now? <laughs> it's like, that's the only way to do it. <laughs> yeah, it really speaks for itself. Yeah, like I you know, I like the idea of this. I'm happy with that idea, you know? Hmm. Because yeah, no, eventually it will hold the plastic tighter because I'll just keep, I'll move the sandbags and put more compost and it will provide, it will perform that function. Yeah. And then catching the water is just extra. Hmm. It's just something it naturally does because of the shape. And then it's a nice feature because of the shape as well. <laughs> but really its job is to help secure the, the plastic on the tunnel. But then I get all this extra growing space. You have plenty of topsoil when you dig out that pond as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the one, that's the main thing about it, trying to figure out what to do with it all. <laughs> yeah, and not to, yeah, to find, figure out something right for it. This, uh, this works really great in, uh, in France. These are, these are uh, blueberries, but <laughs> in France I had, uh, my beds ran downhill and I put uh, black currants at the end of the beds and so they just exploded. Nice, yeah, like within yeah. the second year they were, because they're just catching all yeah, the yeah, excess yeah. nutrients coming off. I, I don't think it'll work here because it's not the same as it was, but it was really, uh, yeah, it worked really great. <laughs> so that's just, yeah, there's onions here, parsnips here, garlic here, potatoes here, and nothing here yet. No. A little shrub nursery there as so. well. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, we, you know, there, there's all, there's hedging planted all along where the coppiced wood is la laid down. So I bought all those as small plugs hmm. and I bought them up myself. So I bought them all for a euro each instead of eight Where'd you get them each. as plugs? Uh, it's actually somewhere, oh no, it's Kildare, not Kilkenny. But yeah, I'll uh, Green Hill Nursery, Green Lane Nursery. Right. I'll, I'll have to have a look when we go inside. Hmm. Yeah, that'll and, be handy. Uh, yeah, and then these are, you know, these are uh, cherries out here. I have two cherry trees at the bottom of the steps. And that's the, that's going to be the wall of raspberries on this side with the, with the pear on the other side. And that's a Loganberry arch. Cool. Um, and when is this just to for this press tunnel. the grass? This oh, tunnel cool. is going here. Cool. As soon as uh, as soon as the I think the temperature is okay. <laughs> uh, Amazing. This is my first experimental uh -huh. pond. Cool. So this one is how's, nothing. That's just a hole in the ground. How's that working? How's that holding water? Pretty good. 
Yeah, I think it's just uh, the clay is becoming. It, we have. Re I don't know what your soil is you like. No, that wouldn't work. Where we would are. it not? It's more <laughs> sandy. Is that, that? It must dry up in the summer, doesn't it? Oh, it would do. Yeah, yeah. I've only dug it a few months ago, a few weeks ago. So that will definitely dry up in the summer. Absolutely. Um, and then it overflows have you behind had, like here. We've, we've, we haven't had rain in like two weeks. No, okay, yeah. no. Wow. no, no, we haven't had rain in two weeks. No, but it's still, uh, there is frost and you see the water level going up as the frost melts in the morning. There is small showers um, and then that overflows behind these trees and I'm going to do another one here and I'm going to use bentonite clay yeah. for, the, yeah. for the one here. So I think the next, so by the time I get down to the bottom, I'll know what technique and method to use mm. for my big pond. I have a bag of bent on my clay and I still haven't put it on the duck pond. <laughs> I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, because like, if it'll work or when you look on YouTube, like there's guys just going around with bags, <laughs> shaking it into ponds. Yeah. Like, is that doing anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. What are you going? Is that what you're going to do? Or? Uh, yeah. Well, it's. I just have a small bag, like see if it does anything. But the ducks are supposed to be helping at least. Uh, yeah. They do what, like leeing and shit. Yeah. I think that's a technique in yeah. itself, like yeah. the ducks. Yeah. Uh, the pigs are the best. Have you seen Sepp Holzer? You've yeah. Been in Austria. Yeah, yeah. In Austria. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. He, his pigs do. He, he does. A whole aquaculture kind of system going on based with pigs and. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. There is a lot, like obviously, you know, Richard Perkins as well. Hmm. Yeah, you know, there is a lot of interesting things happening and it's only to find the to find them. That's why I thought it was great uh, when I made that comment and you got in touch with me because like Ireland is such a small place. Like, I think it would be very easy to have like a community of people that can. I don't know, like it's too far away to be swapping plants and stuff like that but just like ideas yeah, like ideas, you know like yeah. how did the bentonite right. clay work out yeah. you know and then yeah. i'm going to be a step ahead when i use mine you know yeah like i think it's really interesting and really important mm. it's like we're we going to eat yeah yeah for sure. <laughs> thanks for the advice.